this episode of Unvarnished is it's a little different. It's probably the closest thing to what I envisioned when we started this series. Just someone talking candidly about where they are in their career, how they got there, what's worked, and what has not. You'll find that that's exactly what this episode is with Michael Warshall. He is an Australia-based photographer, printer, exotic car collector, uh, retiree for all of two months, and most recently, an internet startup entrepreneur. You'll also notice that there are a few other things that are different about this episode. One, um, it's not really much of an interview. I actually started with one question and Michael took it away from there. Two, the quality of the video is kind of bad. That's because this was actually gonna be a pre-interview. Uh, we used Zoom just to make it quick. Uh, and usually I ask a few questions just to understand what we're gonna talk about in our high definition video. Well, Michael, just took off and started telling stories that were just so great that there was no way I wasn't going to capture this and share it with everyone else. Lastly, I've edited down this conversation from an hour plus down to what I think are the absolute gold nuggets, the points that I just think had to be shared with you, our audience, and have you listened to them at least once, if not more. So enjoy this conversation with Michael Warshall. That was a you know, I thought I was really good. I really was. I thought I was God's gift to photography. So I'm 24 years old. I'm driving a Porsche. I have a Hasselblad camera. I have a studio and I think I'm wonderful. Okay. I think, and in those days, <clears throat> I think the average portrait um, sale in, the, in Melbourne was something around $200 for a session and I was getting 500 bucks. I thought, this guy's good. I then heard about a photographer in America <clears throat> and I wanted to see him and they said, he doesn't see other photographers. So I ran code it cause I was already started printing and they said, I oh, will get you in. <clears throat> so I arrived at the studio in Pasadena. The photographer's name was Philip Cheris amazing looking student. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it was just amazing. We walked in with my friend, um, who was a young photographer. We, we were on a learning journey. I walked in and, and my friend said, look at the beautiful photos. I said, Robert, look at the furniture. I said, these are antiques. I said, this, this is a Persian rug on the floor and here's a chandelier. I said, I've never seen a studio like this. Most studios were dirty dumps. We had a good studio, I thought. Anyway, the quality was amazing. We walked through this distinguished gentleman walks out impeccably dressed. And I went, holy shit, I've never seen a photographer dressed like that in a suit, clean shoes, um, you know, a gold chain. I said, holy moly. Anyway, long story short, uh, I said, oh, you're the, you're the boys from Australia. I said, yeah, that's us. So we walked in and uh, I walked in impeccably clean studio and there was a workroom and there were three women sitting retouching by hand. This is back in the seventies. So this is lesson in life. I repeated because that was my first lesson that taught me stuff I didn't understand. Uh, and um, there was a big desk and there was a, a science at work in progress and there were manila envelopes. Okay, so I, I said, do you mind if I have a look? He said, sure. So there were orders. I took the first order about $3,000, $6,000. I'm going, shit, I'm holding a car in my hand. That's how I thought, because I related everything to cars being kind of $15,000. I said, where did these people come from? And he looked at me, he said, well, we have some money around here in, you know, in Pasadena. He said, uh, there's uh, old money down on the East Coast and there's oil money down in Dallas. He said, if you want to sell Rolls Royces, you don't go to Idaho. And I said, excuse me, don't forget, I'm a young, I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, they grow potatoes in Idaho. No one has Rolls Royces. He said, but if you build a tractor, everyone has to have one. Well, that's right over my head. Didn't understand. On my next trip, I went back. So what I learned is you got to go to where the market is. So I can build Rolls Royces, but if I'm in Idaho, you know how many I'm going to sell? Zero. 
zero. So that was my lesson in life. And that same with this price list. I still carry his price list in my briefcase. So in those days in Australia, the average print was sold for 20 bucks. I sold my prints for 60 bucks. And his eight by 10 was 595 bucks. And I said, holy shit. So I said, so how much is an eight by 10? He said, what the customer is prepared to pay. Remember, if you remember when you were a young virginal kid, you had no idea, you could have told me anything and I would have done because I didn't know. Well, that opened my, I went back and tripled my prices, changed my presentation and nobody said anything. And then I did a course, I remember on this next trip, I can't remember if it was Jay Abrahams or someone else. It was like a thousand bucks, a fortune. And it was on marketing. Because he said to me, there's this course you need to do it on marketing. And I said, being naive, what's that got to do with photography? And he laughed at me. Well, you know, I felt degraded. So what I learned in the mid seventies was two things. One was called direct mail. And the other one is called telemarketing. So when I come back, I started, my friend said, you can't call people at home. I said, why not? He said, you just can't do that. I said, they do it in America. We started telemarketing. And then the next, see, this is the thinking, the difference in thinking. My friends were photographers would come to my studio and see piles of envelopes. You know what the question was? How much were all the stamps? I said, don't worry about it. They're expensive. Don't do it. Okay. We started direct mail and telemarketing business went through the roof. And that was a chance meeting for a photographer that I heard about who told me that I was an idiot because I was trying to build Rolls Royces. And unless I was where they, in, unless I was in uh, LA or New York or Chicago, I ain't going to sell any. And I, I learned that very quickly. Printing was exactly the same. We were the most expensive printer. Okay? But nobody could build what we were building and they wanted it. And when someone else started doing what we were doing and they were cheaper, we had to change. Because printing is all about cost. It's all, you know, it's, it's a run to the bottom. That's why I kept out of the commercial printing. I said, that's not what I want to do. Oh, but we print thousands of sheets. I said, you don't understand. I said, um, the model is simple. I said, you buy a piece of paper for 10 cents. When you put that piece of paper into a magazine, you get 30 cents for it. When I make that into a photograph, I get $4 for it. Same piece of paper. It's exactly the same piece of paper. I just print it differently and I laminate it so it looks like a photograph. Hey, 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 sorry, interrupting here. Just want to let you know we're fast forwarding to Michael's retirement. Let me retire. Uh, two months later, I got totally bored. I didn't, I really didn't know what to do with myself. Um, and because we were printing in the lab, I saw the major changes in the industry five years ago, I said, the, in, the industry that we're in is, is being totally disrupted. Uh, all the photographers were printing less and less. And I said, they, uh, the customers have changed. And I'm, you know, I've been shooting weddings. I've done three and a half thousand weddings myself. So I knew the wedding industry pretty well. And I sat down with a friend of mine who still operates a franchise chain of studios in the portrait market. And I said, Vic, there's something going on here. I said, the market is totally changing. The printing industry is being disrupted. They just don't know it yet. I said, the wedding industry is disrupted and the photographers are scrambling. I said, uh, we have cust had customers who were doing 300 weddings a year and now they're struggling to get uh, 100 weddings a year. I said, um, and we, we continuously bought Ibis reports, which are the industry reports on, on I used to buy it on photography, on printing. And I started analyzing and the, the report basically opened up in Australia saying the portrait market looks bleak. That was the opening statement. He said the school photography market is holding on, but there is growth in the wedding market. And I said, not possible. I said, my photographers are doing less and less. And I said, let's look into what the 80 page report said. And basically what I learned is a new style of customer. I said, so let's find out what the customer wants. So we bought a couple of uh, thousand li uh, list of uh, potential brides and we surveyed them. And the brides told us uh, they wanted 
photojournalistic unstructured photography. And all they wanted at that stage were digital files to share on social media. The types of weddings have changed. So if we look at the brides that we photograph, and I've been doing this for many years, uh, I went into shock. Half the brides that we photographed have been living together between four and 10 years. They already have two and a half kids on an average. They have the dog, they have the mortgage, and they have the cat. And then they decide to get married. I've been with about 46 years, so I'm the old school. You could never have kids before. It, it didn't work like that. So when these brides started doing that, and I'm saying, this is not my understanding, I rang them. See, I've always market research. I rang the bride and said, hey, you just got married. You, you know, you had your three kids in your bridal party and your dog. She said, yeah. I said, you've been living together. She said, oh, 11 years. I said, great. I said, why are you getting married? She said, no, we wanted to have a party with the closest friends. Because in Australia, you've been living together for 12 months. You're de facto. It's half and half anyway. So there's no, you know what I'm saying? Think about it. What's the reason? See, in, in my world, you couldn't get married. You couldn't have kids because you'd be, you know, you'd be taboo. So we realized that these weddings are different. Not only that, they were casual. Most of the weddings we're doing are on the beach, in a garden, um, someone's backyard, in the mountains, uh, in the forest. Small restaurant, normal major, super duper big receptions. Sorry, uh, let me rephrase that. There are, but you know, we're talking 5% of the market. And they didn't want to spend more than 2000 bucks. I said, well, we can automate that. I said, we automated the lab. We were fully automated. I mean, when I looked at analog, we had 150 staff. When we went full digital, full automation, we were down to 40. Everything was automated. We, we you know, got rid of all human intervention. In the old days, we had you know, two operators per digital printer. And here, we had the Indigo could print you know, equivalent to five RP30s. And you only needed one operator. That's a much faster uh, process. So we then said, well, look, there's an opportunity. I said, if we automate the process, we could um, give the bride what she wants. Uh, and then I said, let's do some more testing. So I said, so being a, you know, having print in my blood, um, I used to always say, if it's not printed, it's not real. So we surveyed the brides again. I said, so if we were to give you a high end, uh, life flat photographic album, would you buy one? And over 80% said, yes. I said, okay, so how much would you pay for it? And the average price was $400. So my thinking was, well, that's what I make an album and sell it to the photographer for $400. And the photographer then wants to sell that to the bride for $2,000. The new bride has worked that out and she's telling the photographer to piss off. So I'm not gonna give you 2000 bucks because I don't see the value. So I said, so why don't we just sell directly to the bride and bypass the photographers? So that's the model. So we started a, a new business called Emotion Wedding Photography. Um, totally an online, business and everybody said it'll never work because uh, we're photographers said that we're artists and the bride wants an artist i said that's only in your lunch you know you're, you're dreaming i said i'm an artist i was the most expensive photographer in australia for 30 years i said that model is broken i said the number of customers looking at that model is five percent of the total business i said so let's look at the business i said australia's got 120,000 weddings a year average 90% have photography. And when we surveyed the bride, 85% of those told us they like our style of photography. I said, so let's just go for the mass. I said, let's not worry about the high end because let all the high end photographers fight for the declining market. So we launched, uh, we, we started automating the processes. And I said, the only human intervention will be the physical photographer turning up at the wedding. Everything else will be automated. So we developed a, an online platform that basically matches the photographer to, to the bride's needs um, based on location, uh, customer reviews, and the number of jobs the photographer has done, sort of like Uber. I said, we'll Uberize it. So that's the model. We then started, started making bookings, and then, of course, COVID hit. So that this, in Australia, the wedding industry was totally shut, no weddings, virtually. However, um, some states were better than others, and um, 
we still managed to book 200 weddings. Uh, I then came across um, a founder institute in Silicon Valley. They're a pre-seed accelerator um, because one of my, it's interesting, some of the high-end photographers came to us at the beginning and said, Michael, we know what you're doing. We want to buy in. And I said, well, I said, we can fund it ourselves. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, why aren't you looking at America? I said, mm, interesting. Uh, I said, because Australia, we can fund it ourselves. I said, the investment will be about a million bucks. I said, we can do that ourselves. And they said, you need to look at America. The market is much bigger. And I thought about it. I said, well, shit, it is. It's exactly the same market. I've been to the States. I said, they speak the same language. The weddings are exactly the same. Um, so when I got into the Founder Institute, that was an interesting process. Um, they had 5,000 applicants. Uh, 1,300 got into the um, course, which was an 18-week course, of course, on Zoom, because you couldn't travel. Um, and they basically taught you how to prepare your startup for investment and scaling. So out of the 1,300, 25 graduated, and I was one of them. They then invited me to join what they call the funding lab. Again, in the real world, you would go to Silicon Valley, you spend uh, 16 weeks there, and they would introduce you to VCs and, and um, uh, equity and hedge funds and, you know, to scale you up. Anyway, I graduated, uh, one of a handful. And then um, I got an email to say that uh, looking at what we've achieved and, and how we've put it all together, they feel we are in the top 2% of all the companies that have gone through the Founder Institute. And I'm talking some serious businesses where, you know, we're a small business. I said, we're not your typical startup because they were all based on an app application or some sort of a, um, uh, yeah, mainly apps. I said, we're a, a transactional model. He said, yes, but uh, you understand the market better than most. Um, uh, but that stage, uh, we had three of the top photographers invest in us. They said, we want in now. So they, we, we raised a shitload of money at the beginning. So after we went to the Founder Institute and looking at the market, so the Australian market is small. It's a $500 million market, small by global standards. I said, however, we could get 10% of that market probably within three years because there, there is no brand. Um, it's a very fragmented, disrupted market, sort of like the printing industry now. It's, as, as you know, it's being consolidated. It'll be all the small guys can't compete. They're, they're in deep shit. And I've got friends who are in the same. I mean, as you know, they're closing down daily, including big ones. I said, because the business has changed. Um, so we um, put, put a, uh, a, I suppose, a, um, system together we analyze the market we build a pitch deck which i didn't even know what a pitch deck was but i do now and there so if i said let's look at the english speaking countries to start off with i said mainly america england so if you look at australia uh, usa it's a six billion dollar market i said now we're talking different numbers i said uh, it's exactly the same if i look at the usa market there are no major players and there are no brands in photography it's fragmented. I said, you have a number of aggregators and you have like in Australia and, and, and uh, advertising platforms like the Knot, and they've just been, you know, it's a $1 billion business. And then look what happened to Shutterfly and Snapfish and all the rest of it. I said, it's consolidating. There were no brand leaders in our space and our space is weddings only. Not like, I don't know if you've heard of Snapper. No. No, it's an Australian company, S-N-A-P-P-R. A couple of young guys in Sydney. Um, they were in school photography business. So they decided they're going to Uberize photography. So they were going to organize and match photographers for any type of photography. Um, so you go online and you want to have food photography, they'll find your photographer very cheap. So when they launched the whole professional market went into uproar. How dare they? They're going to kill the market. And I said, no, they're not. I said, they're going to give the customer what the customer wants. So anyway, long story short, they they got us some investment at the beginning, which was, I think they raised half a million dollars in Sydney. 
they went to California. Uh, they came across Y Combinator, they raised two and a half million bucks. Um, the following year, they were in 40 states in the USA. They stayed in, this was just pre COVID. And now they're valued at 80 million. Okay, but it gets even more interesting. There was another company in, in, in Perth. I'm sure you've heard of Canva, come across the young lady, uh, Melanie. We were looking for some software uh, for our indigos for school photographers. This is probably you know the beginning. She had some software called Fusion Books, which was nearly there, but wasn't there. Anyway, we got some software out of Europe. And then if you look at what happened to her, she went to Sydney with her boyfriend. They started Canva. They started, um, they got some money and um, that was uh, 12 years ago, I think. Now they're worth 19 billion, billion. That's the cap. So there were lots of opportunities, but the new business in terms of when you look at a startup, it's nothing like the traditional business. The traditional business being a printer. So, you know, what's your stock, how much equipment, uh, what sort of customer list in the new world, nobody cares about that. They don't even ask you about profit. They want to know how quickly you can scale. And if you look at all the big startups, um, Uber, they've never made any money ever. And they can, you know, so we decided that we'll uh, work on the photography side and printing is, um, I've been in this industry for 45 years. It's not a job. I just love what I do. So photography is what I love and, and printing was just, I, I, you know, latched it on to satisfy my own needs, which is what I normally do. And all my staff used to say, if you can satisfy Michael, you can satisfy anybody. And I'm a very fussy printer. Um, when I and when I wanted when I started looking for people to do work for me, they said, "No, you're too fussy. It's too high end. We're not interested." And I went to all the top printers in Australia. I don't know, I know them all, and I said, "No." Nah. So I, <clears throat> I then thought maybe we'll do it ourselves again. And then I said, "I just don't have the time to to grow this business, the emotion side, and the printing side." I said, "So I will." The emotion side is a much more uh, lucrative business, and it's exciting. And I know it intimately. There's no one that knows more about wedding photography than my uh, co-founder and me. I mean, we've, he's still, he's the only one who still runs a franchise of photography businesses. All photographers are in deep shit, you know? So when you, this is recorded, they're in deep shit. They really are. It, it's, it's sad. When we applied, when we actually um, told the industry what we were going to do, they went into an uproar. And I've been involved in the Australian Institute of Professional Photography. I'm a master photographer, a fellow. I've got all the awards. I've got more awards than you know, Moses. And they still believe that that's the model. I said, that model's broken. <clears throat> it's, it doesn't work. And um, when I put an ad on the IIPP site to say, we're looking for photographers, they took it off and they said, you can't do that. I said, you, you know, you, you're going to bastardize photography. I said, well, guess what? I'm going to give the bride what she wants. I said, I'm not doing anything different to what she wants. We serve out thousands of brides. They told us what they want. I said, my business all my life has been built on two premises. Who is your customer and what do they want? I said, we're going to give her what she wants. That's it. You can give her what you want. I said, we're going to give her what she wants. It's the same for everything. It doesn't matter photography or printing it's all the same i said it's satisfying someone's needs and if you give them what they want in return they're going to give you money and they're going to tell everybody about it so we're in the traditional business printing is traditional right. and it's changing it's changing um there are some people who change with it and others who want to change the customers and that ain't gonna work you can't change the customers they're well, I hope you enjoyed this interview with Michael Warshall as much as I did. My two big takeaways are his insatiable appetite to keep learning and his laser focus on the end customer. And I think those two attributes are what made him so successful in business. Well, I hope we get... <clears throat> well, thanks again, for... thanks again for watching this episode of Unvarnished. See you at the next episode. Yeah. See you on the next... <clears throat> Thanks again for watching Unvarnished. See you on the next episode. <laughs> <laughs>